This is Artemis Launch Control. Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson just called uh, a scrub for the launch attempt today, the second launch attempt. So yeah, you guys know the routine, deja vu all over again, and my launch scrub four times, and so on and so on, etc, etc. But really, is this what is actually going on? Is this actually routine? Well, obviously it isn't. The mission that Administrator Nelson is referring to, the one that got scrubbed four times, was scrubbed first of all for a number of different reasons, not just a recurring high hydrogen leak, but on top of that, it is tied for the most scrubbed launch in shuttle history. I think it'd be a good idea for him to refer to a different launch, but do we actually have an example of anything that went this wrong in the history of the shuttle program? Well, as a matter of fact, we do. Now, to find a mission this screwed up, you have to go all the way back to 1990 for the 10th flight of Space Shuttle Columbia, STS-35. Like the SLS program, it too experienced a very significant hydrogen leak that was incredibly difficult to track down. Now, of course, this was the 10th flight, and so therefore we can expect the launch tower to have had some difficulties and perhaps some fatigue after so many launches. But excuses aside, this was a very serious problem, and it delayed everything for a very long time. As a matter of fact, Columbia had to be moved off the pad in order to make room for another launch. And if SLS is delayed in a similar fashion, we could be waiting a very long time before this thing ever takes off. Hello YouTube, I'm the Angry Astronaut, and this is... Now, as we all know, SLS has experienced repeated hydrogen leaks during this process, but this was the mother of all hydrogen leaks, far more serious than anything that had happened before as the result of a tank connector between the ground systems and the rocket. In my opinion, once again, this is a ground systems problem given how well SLS performed during the green run, but I'm not going to go into that. I've said it too many times in previous videos, so NASA engineers tried to staunch the leak at first. They tried to warm the tank connector and then chill it with cold fuel in order to seal it, but that didn't work. Then they tried to repressurize it with helium. That didn't work. And then they returned to the warm and chill method. And of course, that didn't work either. And given how serious this leak was, there's absolutely no way that SLS could launch. And so therefore, it didn't. And there is apparently a suspicious incident that took place that may be the culprit for what happened. There was an error in overpressurization during the fueling process that put three times the fuel pressure on the line than it was designed for. Now that seems to be just too big of an incident to be a coincidence given the fact that this had just gone through a more serious problem in terms of a hydrogen leak than it had ever experienced in the past and there was this user error or what appeared to be some sort of human error in the whole fueling process. So once again, we have a situation where SLS theoretically could have taken off twice, or perhaps, once again, this is a bit of speculation on my part. The first launch was put off simply because of a temperature sensor on the third engine, which means that the information we were getting was faulty. There was no problem with the engine and it could have launched. And then on top of that, on the second launch attempt, we had user error that once again prevented the launch. Now, these things certainly can happen, but this is a very bad time for it to happen. And now this gasket is almost certainly going to have to be replaced. In addition to that, they're going to have to figure out whether or not they're going to have to try to do that at the pad, which will require a special enclosure to be built or just return the rocket into the VAB. In my opinion, they're going to do the latter, hence the title of this video. But it gets worse than that. In addition, 
mention the flight termination hardware, in other words, the explosive used to go ahead and destroy this ship in case something were to happen after the launch, all of that needs to be recertified. It was only certified through the initial launch window, which of course is going to be missed at this point. Now, an exception could be made, but a decision on that has not yet been forthcoming. And honestly, that's going to be a very tough decision because flight termination equipment is extremely important. So here's the bottom line. We can expect a delay of at least several weeks before another launch attempt is made. Really, NASA needs to track down these ongoing hydrogen leaks and find out just how they're happening, at what point they're happening, and whether or not it's the rocket, which once again, I find to be highly unlikely, or the ground systems. And then once they've done that, they need to track it all down. Of course, the problem is, as I've mentioned many times in the past, several contractors were involved in the construction of the ground systems and the launch tower. All of them did a terrible job and they didn't really coordinate with one another, which means tracking anything down in this launch tower is going to be extremely challenging. And of course, there's also the possibility of unstacking the solid rocket boosters, possibly opening the rocket up in order to do further work, further testing. And all of this harkens back to a particular mission that has been long forgotten that had lots of the same problems. As I mentioned before, STS-35 in 1990. As I mentioned before, this was the most cursed mission in shuttle history, at least as far as pre-launch situations are concerned. Obviously, the most cursed launches were the ones involving Challenger and then, of course, the return of Columbia. However, on May 30th of 1990, the scheduled launch was scrubbed because of a minor hydrogen leak in the tail service mast on the mobile launch platform, and then a major leak in the external tank Quick dis disconnect assembly. Does that sound familiar? Yes, this has happened before. Hydrogen was also detected in the orbiter's aft compartment and was believed to be associated in with a leak involving the umbilical assemblies. Once again, this is probably a similar situation that's happening right now. Now, they confirmed all of this on June 6th of 1990. They couldn't repair it at the pad, so they took it back to the VAB and started work. The umbilical assembly was replaced by one borrowed from space shuttle Endeavor, which is something that isn't really a feasible thing at this point, since that was under construction at the time and we don't have multiple launch towers and multiple space shuttles right now. And then on top of that, new umbilicals were fixed to the external tank. That was a lot of work. They rolled it out on August 9th, 1990. And here we go again. During tanking, high concentrations of hydrogen were again found in the orbiter aft compartment and there was another postponement. NASA then concluded that there were multiple hydrogen leaks, one in the umbilicals which they had swapped out, but also in three hydrogen recirculation pumps in the aft compartment. These were replaced and retested. There was also a damaged kept Teflon cover seal in engine number three, interestingly enough, and that hydrogen pre-valve in the engine was replaced. They rescheduled them long launch for the 18th of September 1990 and guess what more hydrogen leaks. The launch was scrubbed yet again. So Columbia was transferred to a different launch pad in order to make room for Atlantis. Get the hell out of the way, Columbia. I've got work to do, said Atlantis. And so here we go. Then Tropical Storm Klaus really started to complicate matters, and this could happen during this launch attempt too. The later we get in the year, the greater the chance that Florida's series of tropical storms and hurricanes that tend to hit this area are going to further complicate SLS's launch attempt. Things are just not going to get any easier. But in any event, Columbia was tested again, this time by using special sensors and video cameras and employing a see-through plexiglass 
aft compartment door in order to track down the hydrogen leakage, but guess what? None was detected. So, with the problem apparently resolved, they just had to wait for Atlantis to take off, which was another four-week delay, and they set a scheduled launch date of November 30th, but that was moved up until December 2nd of 1990. And then, to everyone's great relief in a spectacular nighttime launch, Columbia finally took to the skies to carry out a very important mission that went extremely well. So, what can we learn from this? Well, that hydrogen leaks can happen, and sometimes they can be damn hard to track down, but also this was the 10th launch of Columbia. This launch tower had been put through a great deal of work already, and so had the orbiter for that matter, so we could expect some issues to start to crop up. It's also worth mentioning that on Columbia's first attempt at launch, the maiden launch of the entire program, it was only scrubbed once, and for a minor software issue that only delayed it for two days. So, not really sure if this is a fair comparison, but still, it is a comparison. And if this is happening, if we have something this complicated going on, there are serious problems with this. Number one, we don't have a lot of spare umbilical equipment available to us from extra launch towers, extra space shuttles, because we only have one SLS and one mobile launch tower right now. I'm sure that can probably be addressed, but number two, Mobile Launch Tower 1 is not nearly as thoroughly understood as the shuttle launch towers were. Any sort of replacements, any sort of swap outs that take place with this tower are going to be done in an environment where nobody really understands the overall design. That could complicate things a lot as well. And if all of this goes about the same as STS-35 did, which it's really starting to look like, that suggests a five-month delay. Let me say that again, a five-month delay, which means we are very probably looking at a launch sometime at the beginning of 2023. Fortunately, Congress does not seem to be putting any pressure on Administrator Nelson to move any faster on this program. That's a good thing. First of all, because probably they don't understand how unacceptable this is. Secondly, they're used to wasting taxpayer money anyway. And thirdly, if they were to cancel it at this point, we would be the laughing stock of the world as far as spaceflight is concerned. And I'm sure the Russians would make all kinds of comments on how they can send some broomsticks over to help us out. So that's working in our favor. And there are other considerations. First of all, we really don't know how much stress we put SLS through up to this point. This thing has taken forever to build, and these SRBs have been stacked forever, and if it does get delayed for five months, they're probably going to have to be unstacked and restacked in order to be safe. And on top of that, we really just don't understand what this kind of delay is going to do to a launch attempt after so many fueling attempts, so many failed wet rehearsals, so many failed launch attempts, etc. And comparing it to the most delayed and the most screwed up launch process in space shuttle history is not a very fair comparison to be making anyway. We're really setting the bar incredibly low if we're comparing the launch of our flagship rocket against the worst shuttle launch attempt in history, aside, of course, from Challenger. Repeatedly fueling, detanking, and refueling with this rocket is just not a good idea. It's not like Starship that's made out of stainless steel here. It's made out of much lighter materials and also insulation materials that have a tendency to crack. The more we do this, the more stress we put the rocket through, and the more likely it's going to blow up on the pad or sometime during 
the launch attempt, or it just may not be in good enough shape to NASA to it for NASA rather to attempt this at all, which means this rocket might end up going on to the scrap heap, which would be a dagger in the heart of the Artemis program. This is not the way NASA wanted this to go, obviously. This is not standard operating procedure as NASA experienced during the shuttle program. There were dozens of shuttle launches that took place without a scrub at all, and as I've said, there are only two launches that had four or more scrubs. Really, this is not a fair comparison to be making and really not acceptable either. It's time for NASA to face up to this and realize that there is a significant problem somewhere in this process, most probably in the ground systems. But if there was an error made that caused this leak in the first place on the most recent launch attempt, that's something that needs to be addressed too. It's very important that SLS get off the ground. I actually really want this mission to go. I don't want to keep making these damn videos. Videos. I want to make a video about SLS taking to the skies and Boeing and NASA finally redeeming themselves. Although, to be honest, after all of this, I think it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for NASA to really redeem themselves unless Artemis 2 makes a much, much better show of things. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please check the description for various ways to support my channel while I'm over here here in Europe, and as always, stay angry about space!